Thanks, Jonathan. Our first session, for our first session, we'll have two talks on uh, audiovisual <coughs> topics. First talk will be Antonio Toralba, who is a professor of uh, electrical engineering and computer science at MIT, uh, the MIT director of the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab, and a lot of other impressive stuff that I will try to compress on the fly. Um, he has been editor of top journals and organizer of top conferences and won many awards. And today <laughs> he will tell us about uh, learning to see and hear. Thank you, Antonio. OK, thank you. So do I have a microphone? Yeah. OK, great. Let's see if this works. OK, so um, I'm going to talk uh, about a mixture of computer vision and audition, and probably the introduction will be worth for me and Tali. So it's a really exciting time in computer vision. So that's where I normally live. Uh, I, most of my research is in computer vision. I, I'm part of the, actually of the computer science and artificial intelligence lab, one of the last people to register to the conference. And so it's a really exciting time for computer vision, as probably many of you know, but things haven't been like that all the time. Like if you just get uh, a few years ago, a new student gets into computer vision, he's really excited because he hears about all these models and data sets. So he takes one data set, uh, picks a model, trains the algorithm, takes an image, runs the algorithm, and this is the output. And this was you know, the standard thing that was happening all the time. So what was going on here? This was the descriptor that was the state of the art in computer vision, not even 10 years ago. This was the hog descriptor. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. This is just the recipe that you need to apply to an image in order to compute the descriptor that will allow you then to apply a classifier and train an object detection algorithm, for instance. So, it's a complicated set of non-linearities and, line and linear operations, and at the end you get some vector, and you don't really know what is going on at the end. So one of my students actually tried to reverse this process and try to visualize what is the set of equivalent images that will give you the same set of descriptors for that image. So what I'm going to show you is just a bunch of images that come from running a detector on an image for certain classes and picking the, the regions where the detector is very confident that there is a particular object. And what you see here is this visualization of the inverse of the descriptor. So the top row is where the detector was detecting people, then the middle row is chairs, and the bottom row is cars. So can you tell which ones of those are mistakes? Any guesses? Yes? There is a dog maybe there in the middle. Yes, that's right. In fact, they are all errors. These are the actual images. And when you look at the, what the descriptor was seeing, you know, it looks pretty much like the object is looking for. No? Like the, you look at the first image in the top row, the one on the left, it looks like a person looking into a mirror. No? You can tell stories about what these people are doing. Or the last one no? is actually just the cows the rear. So, <laughs> It was very frustrating, but it, there was really nothing we could do. So vision was really hard at the time. No? It's, it still is. It's, it's a very hard thing. So why is it so hard? Well, you know, if you look at David Marr's book on vision, it explains you know, all the things that make vision very difficult. You try to interpret the scene from this live feel of uh, lights hitting your, your eye. So it's a very interesting book. It's pretty old, but it's still you know, many of the things about what makes vision hard were, are still very relevant. So one of the things that make vision really hard is the structure of ambient light. You know, if you think of a scene, and you think of the sun illuminating this scene, it's emitting light rays in all directions. Let's consider just one light ray for simplicity. That light ray goes into the scene, hits a surface, the spreads reflections in all directions. Each of those reflections hits other surfaces, and it, you know, it creates a mess. And in the middle of all of this, there is the observer that is trying to make sense of what is seen. So it's just amazing that we can actually make sense of you know, what we see just from this mess of light rays hitting our eyes. And, and in fact, you, know, you are so good at it because you have a lot of knowledge about the world. 
so probably some of you have seen this video, it's a very low resolution video that shows the power of your visual system. Now you're looking at this and you recognize everything that is going on despite that some of the objects take like only one or two pixels worth of information. So the reason why you are able to do that is because in order for you to make sense of this complicated life feel of, of, you know, of lights, you need to have a lot of prior information. You need to know a lot about the structure of the world. So if we look at the actual high resolution video, here it is, no? it shows exactly that you know, things were not really what you thought there were. You know, you're making a few assumptions about the structure of the world. I think he's really good with the mouse. <laughs> but in fact, that, you know, all that prior information is just what allows you to see images like this one and make sense of everything you see. There are, even when you have high resolution images, there are a lot of things going on in a picture and you have to make all kinds of assumptions in order to see it. For instance, in this particular picture, have you noticed anything strange? Just raise your hand if you have seen something strange. No? Okay, maybe let's put it again. So just raise your hand if you see anything strange. Yep, yep, don't say it. Just raise your hand. Okay, there is about 10 people that have seen something, maybe half of the room now. Okay, I'll do it again, but now pay attention to one of the buildings here, to the building in this side. It's changing slowly in front of your eyes, morphing into a different building. In fact, there are all kinds of things happening in this picture. There is this person there on the, on the, on the, on the sidewalk, wasn't there at the beginning, so if I flip to the previous image, here it is. There are around 30% of the pixels that are changing in front of your eyes, but you don't see them. Why? Because you know, in order for you to make sense of the world, you have a lot of priors. One of those priors is that the world does not change slowly into something different. Otherwise, you know, you'll become crazy trying to look for all the small differences, you know, just assume that the world is stable, and that those are the things that make you capable of understanding the world. The same thing happens with sounds. In fact, you know, most of you, you know, probably all of you, are working with sounds, and you, know, you have this other book that also tells you all the things that make scene auditory scene analysis difficult. This book is actually much larger, it's like much thicker than David Marsh's book. Probably you think that your field is a lot harder than ours. You know? And it's true that if you look at the structure of ambient sounds, you have something very similar. No? You have a, a person here, that person is talking and emitting sound waves, and those sound waves bounce against all the surfaces in the space, creating you know, all kinds of reflections. Then there is an, maybe an animal here also making sounds. You have another animal making more sounds, and in the middle you have a you know, an observer with an ear trying to make sense of everything that is going on here. So part of what we want to do in, in my talk and Tali's talk is, you know, we want to put these two books together and show that, you know, when you do this, things get a lot simpler, okay? What can go wrong if you put all these signals together? And there is a lot of work in the past showing, you know, what happens if you combine vision and audition together and, you know, I'm not going to review all the things that have happened in the past, so there is a lot of great work showing you know, uh, that you can interpret um, a speech much better if you have vision and audio and so on. I'm not going to go there. So one of the things that happens in, has happened in the last years is you know, the emergence of deep learning, which is making many of the things in computer vision work really well right now. And another thing that also has happened is big data, the fact that now we have much larger data sets than we had before. So if you plot um, the data set sizes, the number of images that they have according to time, if you look at the evolution of computer vision data sets, it more or less looks like this. You know, it started in the 70s with one picture, everybody was working with the same image, and then over time, you know, it increased by exponentially. And now we are almost hitting the point in which you have enough data the same amount of data that a two-year-old kid gets to see. So we really are running out of excuses for it not to work. And how do we build these data sets? Crowdsourcing. You hire a bunch of people, you put them on a room, and they have to annotate all your images in order to collect ground truth. And you know, I hire my mother, actually, because you know, when you hire people out outside, they, they, they do lots of crazy things. So I hired my mother. She's been labeling since 2008. So she's the most professional annotator out there right now. 
She's labeling, you know, this is an example of an image annotated by her. So it's very detailed with lots of objects. L objects have parts. So it's just very detailed. Every single pix pixel has one semantic label associated with it. So it's very, very detailed annotations. And these are examples of images that she labeled. There are around 22,000 images fully annotated like that. And we have made the data set available. It contains uh, almost more than half a million polygons annotated. So this is, uh, like there are other data sets out there that are also very large, but generally, uh, generally they are annotated by a lot of people. No? Maybe like they hire like 10,000 people on Mechanical Turk. This is one single person, my mother, and it's almost as big as the other data sets in terms of polygons. So it's uh, very, very, very interesting and very high quality. So it's available for, for you to use. But the thing is that, so deep learning in order to work, it needs this very big amount of data for you to train the algorithms. And this is very different from how kids learn to see. So here is an example of a kid learning to understand the visual world. So let's watch it. I understand and watch the birds. And I like to watch the frogs in the pond. Curl up in my hollow tree and dream about tea. The end. <laughs> so just like machines, they want to have a lot of data. And they don't like it if you stop giving them data. <laughs> but what is really interesting here is that the supervision that the mother is given to this kid about what is the content of this visual book is given with another signal, that is the speech signal, which also the kid doesn't know how to interpret because it's a language that the kid wasn't born knowing. So the supervision is encoded in some weird way, and what is seen is also encoded in some other weird way, and it has to make sense of both things together. So it's a very interesting learning setting. And in particular, in computer vision, there is a lot of work devoted about combining like images and text, which is very different than a speech, because text, so this is the typical work on image captioning, text is something like this. Now you have an image, and then you have a sentence describing the content of this picture. You have a lot of things that you need to worry about, no? like you, know, you don't know what the pixels mean, and you need to understand what is the correlation between different regions of the picture and the words that appear in the text. But still, no, the words are cut for you. The word table will always appear in the same way, so there is no noise in your observation. These are not citizens you know, with, the same, with the same level of, of complexity. The image is really complex. The text you know, it has all the complexity of semantics, but the signal itself is very simple. So our task here was, can we use speech instead of captions, and can we discover objects and words from a speech signal? So the input is raw pixels and also raw audio, and this will be like sentences describing what the content of the image is, and the goal is to discover both words in the speech and pixels in the, and regions and objects in the image. So this is work done in collaboration with David Hardway and Jim Glass. David, this is his thesis, so most of the things that I will be talking in this first part are, are his work, and he's somewhere sitting in the room, and you can ask him more questions if you want to know more. So one of the first things that we did was to collect data describing images. So crowdsourcing again, you put in Mechanical Turk a bunch of images, and you just ask people to describe the content of the images. So here is an example of one of those data points that we use for training. So you'll hear just the description given by a person in Mechanical Turk about the content of this picture. Oops. This is a photo of a girl standing in front of a lighthouse. The little girl is wearing a blueprint dress. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. The lighthouse in the background is white with a red roof. So there are you know, it's a complicated sentence describing the content of the picture. Some of the words refer to the visual content, some others don't. And you need to understand all of those things. Here is a different caption. This picture is of two cupcakes against a pink background and on a plate. The cupcakes have frosting and cream swirled on top of them. The cupcakes are brown. You know, different speakers and different ways of talking and you have to deal with all that variability. So now the speech signal and the image are, they have the same degree of complexity. 
so this is how David solved this problem. We defined, we, we built an architecture that uh, has two pathways. One that is going to process images and another that is going to process the speech signal. For images, we use a standard uh, vision architecture. This is, a, for those that you know, this is BGGNet. What it does is just, it takes the input image and it passes through a series of convolutions and nonlinearities until it outputs a tensor that has 14 times 14 spatial locations. So it's like taking this image and dividing it in 14 by 14 windows. It's not exactly like that, but more or less. And then at each window, it computes a descriptor that has 1,024 dimensions. So that's what this network is going to do. Then there is another pathway that is going to take the speech signal as input. The first thing that it does is transforms the speech into a spectrogram. This step maybe is not totally necessary, but when we started here, you know, and working with a speech signal is very hard not to, to working with a speech um, researchers is very hard not to use the spectrogram at some point. So, you know, the first thing that you do is compute a spectrogram and then it's an image. So you do the same thing. You have a series of convolutions and nonlinearities, and at the end, you represent that spectrogram as a, as a matrix that is going to be like 128 times 1,024. 128 is like dividing your speech signal into 128 windows, not exactly like that, but more or less. And each window will be described by a 124 dimensional vector. And now you put the two things together. So one of the important things is that before we train the system, this system doesn't know anything about the speech or about vision. So all the, back, all the weights that are defining this um, these networks are initialized at random. So the system really doesn't know how to process objects or how to process a speech signal. So now you take these two signals and you just do a tensor product. What it's going to do is going to do the product between these two matrices and sum over the descriptor. So it's going to be a sum over 1024 dimensions. Basically what it's going to do is we'll compress this into a single array that will have 14 times 14 dimensions for the image and 128 for the temporal dimension. So if the system worked, if it was trained already and it knew what words are and what objects are, what we will expect is that, so this basically is saying that for each location and each temporal window, it will compute the correlation between the descriptors in the image domain and the speech domain. If that were corresponds to what is being, you know, to the concept that is being represented in that particular image location, I will expect a high correlation if I have learned an embedding that properly encodes both things into the same, in the same point in the space. And if they correspond to different things, I will expect a low correlation, close to zero. So we will expect that, you know, if we plot the maximum of this correlation, it will look something like this, where there are big blobs with high energy, high correlation indicating that a particular piece of the speech signal highly correlates with a particular piece of the image. But at the beginning, if this is randomly initialized, of course, these things will not look like that. So how do you train it? The only training signal that we'll provide is that if you have an image and a caption that goes with that image, what we know is that the correlation should be high somewhere. We don't know exactly where because we don't know what alignment is, but we know that it should be high somewhere. But if you take a random pair of an image and a speech signal that doesn't correspond to that image, then we expect that there shouldn't be any high correlations. Most of the time it could happen that at some point there is a word that just happens to be in the picture. But in general, we expect that the correlations will be low. So the training consists on looking at the maximum response here or some you know, global measurement of the activity in this region and in this output, we want that there should be high values for pairs of images and captions that go together and low values for images and captions that don't go together. That's the only training signal that will be provided. And then, you know, just write your cost function, gradient descent, and cross your fingers. It doesn't work, then you throw it again, and you know, you're not the drill, no? Try it many times until it works. And, you know, it, it's amazing that it eventually it works. I, um, it just, it's just astonishing that it does anything. So here is an example of the output once the system has been trained and it has converged. So what I will show now is uh, an example of an image and the spoken caption, and it will highlight the regions that correspond 
to what is being said at any moment. Oops. Here we see a stretch of grass and a small road leading up to a very old ancient ruin. So it's pretty, it's pretty good. Here's another example. This is a photo of a girl standing in front of a lighthouse. The little girl is wearing a blueprint dress. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. The lighthouse in the background is white with a red roof. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's not perfect. There are some words that were not located, like when it's talking about the blue eyes or you know, uh, the blonde hair. But most of the time, it's picking up like big, some of the big objects, and it seems to know what they are. Here in this picture, there's some skiers going up a mountain. And what is what is really interesting is that you know, this is actually finding these correlations between the words, is discovering words or pieces of sentences in the in the speech signal and how they match the content in the picture. So this is one of the one of the things that uh, we are after. We are trying to try to remove the need for this sophisticated labeling of images and try to get closer of how kids learn. But kids actually learn to understand the world even in a more unconstrained environment than when the parent is talking. Most of the time, the kids are just by themselves, and they play with the world. And that also teaches, teaches them how to interpret the content of a picture. So for instance, here, let's, let's watch a kid just learning. It's touching things, uh. see, feeling how they feel, the sound that they make, uh. and then you put it in the mouth you know, to get that final bit of information. <laughs> this is the supervision, actually. So what is really interesting is that here, the kid is just combining a number of different senses in order to make sense of the content of the world, what, what objects exist out there. So it's a really a self-supervised system most of the time. It's trying to learn by itself with no need of a parent. Of course, at the end, a parent is necessary. You know, otherwise, probably we'll just, you know, we wouldn't even know how to make a fire. But still, no, you know how to perceive the world and make sense of it. So in particular, you learn things about materials, you know, how hard something is, soft. Uh, you can learn properties of the different materials that you, that you touch by combining how they feel, how they sound, and so on. Oops. Okay, so this is, um, this is our version of a one-year-old kid. Uh, this is Andrew Owens. Uh, he was doing the, a PhD thesis um, with, uh, with me and Bill Freeman. And in his thesis, he tried to combine audition and vision. And in order to make the problem very simple, instead of grabbing things and making them sound, he went with a drumstick and started hitting things in the world just to make the interaction as simple as possible because we didn't really know if it was going to work at all. So we just wanted to simplify everything as much as we could. And this is work done in collaboration with uh, uh, Andrew, where he's the one that actually did most of it, and Jia Jun, and then Josh McDermott, that is probably around there, and Bill Freeman, who works uh, here with you, and me. So here is the data set that he, Andrew, collected. So he just went around and started hitting everything for around two months. Uh, you know, he entered our office and just started hitting stuff. You know, and, and so he called this the greatest hits data set. And it consists of around 46,000 hits and scratches of different materials. So this is a lot of hitting. And the drumstick is fine, by the way. So uh, all the data is available for you to use. So here is how we decided to use this. So we wanted to define a system that will learn by itself. And in this case, we define a self-supervised system with the following task. The input is just the visual content, just the images. And we train a system to predict what is the sound that you should hear with that particular sequence of inputs. And the motivation here is that if you are able to go from the visual input to the actual sound that you should hear, it means that the system itself has learned something about material properties and so on, because otherwise you know, the sound wouldn't really correspond. So here is how uh, we build this system. The first thing is encoding the sound signal. Here we use something very similar to the, to the spectrogram, in this case a cochleogram, just for the particular choice of filters. So, sorry, let me describe this a little bit better. So here, uh, in this cochleogram, 
what you see here in this point of high energy, energy. so energy here is just dark values in this image. Uh, vertical axis is just the frequency, so higher is like higher frequencies, and in the middle is the point of contact where there is a heat. So the first thing is just to see that really different materials produce different types of signals. So here is just the average sound, the average cochleogram that you see for when you hit cloth. So you can see that here is mostly sound in the low frequencies. If you hit a rock, then you hear mostly sounds in the high frequencies, so, you know, just what you will expect. If you hit grass, then you, know, you hear just something weird. So now what we wanted to do was to use a system that will predict the sounds given the images. And at the time, this was kind of the state of the art type of thing that you could do if you wanted to predict sequences. So you start with the image, you pass it through some image processing network. In this case, was AlexNet, which probably many of you have used. So this is just operating at the frame level. It doesn't sit tem time. And then you have a recurrent neural network that just puts together different slices of time. And the output will be the cochleogram that you should hear for each time window if you are seeing that particular sequence. And now, once you have the cochleogram, we want to reconstruct the waveform. The problem is that just going from the cochleogram to the waveform, it doesn't sound good. Generally, when you estimate these things, it's, they are always blurry, so you're missing lots of the different sound details that make a sound real. So in order to get real sounds, what we did here is uh, something very typical in texture synthesis. You take your sound database that you were using for training, you take a window of this cochleogram, and you look in the sound database which sound seems to have the closest cochleogram to that one. And then you take the audio sound that comes from that video and just paste it on your output waveform. And you do this for different windows. So it's just uh, it's a, a little bit of a hacky way of creating real sounds. But it still, it's driven by your predictions. So what I will play now is you will see a video, and what you will hear is the predicted sound. It's not the actual sound that came from the video. You are going to hear it. Okay. So it's not perfect, but no, it, it, you, you can hear the sound when there is a collision. The system actually didn't learn. We didn't actually provide the training data with a line precision on when there is a hit. The system has to learn that a collision is the moment where you hear a sound. So that's actually something that is learned by the system. It makes the distinction between a hit and a scratch. You know, sometimes it misses things. And it's useful to actually know where the sounds are coming from. So what we'll show now is the actual, you know, the output that you just hear, and the pieces where that audio is coming from. So the small video here just shows the original video that contains the sound that you actually hear. It's not perfect, but you know, more or less it fools you sometimes. So here is another example. Okay, this is horrible. Uh, and the problem here is just that this, you know, we recorded this in Boston. Water is mostly solid. So the system wasn't really trained with this. And, you know, as soon as you have something out of sample, it's just, it just doesn't work very well. But it's still, you know, it, it does something. Another really cool thing is that then Andrew tried what happens if you use other actions. So all the system is trained with the drumstick hitting things. But what happens is in, if it's stiff of a drumstick, there is something else hitting the space. What do you hear? So it's pretty nice. The system has never seen a bouncing ball before. But it still was able to more or less correlate the, 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 the sound with the point of impact. Here is another example. So it, it, it's amazing no, how well it's able to generalize to, to something totally different. And of course, you know, sometimes it just uh, produces crazy things. 
Anyway, this was uh, several years ago. I'm sure that we could do much better. In fact, you can do much better. You just have the data, yeah. train a system. It's good sometimes to do something that looks like it could work much better, but it doesn't work very well in the publication that you see. Then you get a lot of citations because everybody wants to do it. So it's, oh, I can do much better for sure. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's just a good strategy to get paper citations. So, so then the, the other thing is, okay, we wanted to know how good that sounds, those sounds are, so we did this just a real or fake study where we show people uh, a video with sound and you have to guess if it was real or fake. So I'm going to play two and you have to guess which one is the real and which one is the fake. Oops. Sometimes the audio doesn't work very well. Okay, let's, let's skip this because I, I don't think you hear anything. But basically this is the, the um, the output. So here, so what you will expect is that if you are able to very well synthesize sounds, then people should be at chance here. No, it should be 50%. So our model is at 40% in generating sounds, which means that, well, people could still guess if it was real or fake, better than chance, but pretty close to, you know, it's pretty close to being full. So I think, you know, you have a lot of room to do much better than us here. So another really interesting thing then was that, of course, you learn by hitting things and hearing the sounds that they make, but the world is already making sounds for you. You hear all kinds of sounds, and it's like if the, sound, if the world had its own speech captioning system that is telling you all the time which things are out there. So when you are in a particular scene, you hear all kinds of ambient sounds. You hear people talking, you hear the noise of cars, and so on. So, you can also use that signal as if it was a speech signal and try to learn about objects. And there are lots of objects that make sounds that are very special to them. So we train a system very similar how we did before, but with ambient sounds. So the type of videos that we use for training are videos like this one. And we use the same task. The goal is to have a system that takes as input the visual video, the visual frames, and try to predict the sounds that you should hear if you were in that scene. And the idea is that if you are able to do this, the only way that you can predict what you should hear is if you are able to understand which objects are in the world. Now, if you, if you want to predict that you should hear the noise of a car, it means that somehow you have to be able to detect a car in the picture, otherwise how the system will be able to successfully make that prediction. So it's a way of suddenly having a system discover high level concepts on the picture. So this is going to be much more higher level than the previous one where everything was about the materials that you are hitting. This will be about the objects that you see in the world. So um, we use a very similar architecture. In this case, actually, we didn't even use video to train. It's just a single frame, and from the frame, you should predict what is the audio that you should hear if you were in that particular scene. So you don't get to see even to see which things are moving. You really need to get at the semantics of the picture. So what is really interesting is what did the network learn when it was trained to solve this task? And you can actually see what the network learns by looking inside the network like a neuroscientist probing what different units in the network have, been, have become sensitive to. And so things that we discovered is that there were units that become sensitive to people. So these are, for instance, one of the units in the last convolutional layers um, in AlexNet before the, no the fully connected layers. And one of the units, in this case, unit 19, um, 90, out of the 256 units that are in that layer is responsive to faces. So these are the top five images that most strongly activate that unit. And these are the regions that activate that unit. So it's really detecting the faces. But it was just trained to predict the ambient sounds. It wasn't trained to detect faces. We never had to label, hand label anything. Um, there are a bunch of units that actually detect faces with different sizes. There are units that detect baby faces because they make another type of sound. There are units that detect crowds of people because the sound that they make is also very different than a single person. There are units detecting water and the ocean. There are units detecting the sky, probably because of the wind. There are units detecting cars. Uh, it's not a very good car detector, but it's clearly detecting cars more than anything else. 
In fact, this is the unit that detects people. So this is many more images than just the top five. And you can see that it's really a pretty good and reliable face detector. And this is the one detecting cars. So it's mostly finding on cars, but there are a lot of mistakes. So you cannot use this for autonomous driving, for instance. You wouldn't survive more than a minute in that car. But you know, more or less, it's detecting cars. And the fun thing is that it's been done just from the audio itself. It has never really learned from manually annotated data. Then this is the same thing, but trained with a database of instruments. And there are units that become sensitive to particular instruments in this data set. So there is one unit that detects only guitars. There is another unit that detects only pianos. And the fun thing is that, so it's detecting this on the image. It doesn't even use the audio at some point. So once you have trained the system, you can remove the audio. And it's, it has learned to detect these objects by their visual appearance. And you can actually locate which regions of the picture seems to be responsible of different types of sounds. So for instance, here, if we ask which part of this picture will be responsible of hearing water, <laughs> These regions will produce that type of sounds, or here, this well, region. <laughs> so it has learned to collocate, to learn what sounds correspond to which regions of the picture. So, so the interesting thing is, so here we are really interested in using the audio to discover objects in the world. Our goal is not to, uh, to understand the audio signal like in a signal processing way, but really to try to understand what is the content of the world and to discover objects in an unsupervised way. So now we can do things like, uh, you know, if you have a, um, a video like this one, we want to be able to tell you, you know, that there are a number of pixels here that are the ones that seem to be making the sound. This is where the sound is coming from that there are two different objects that make two different types of sounds. But then what you really want also is you want to be able to also, so it seems like we are very close here to solving this, to, to addressing this problem of uh, source separation. And it's something that Tal is going to talk a lot more. So I, not go, I will not go much into details here. But what we've done is we build a system that allows you to click on a pixel and be able to listen what is the sound wave that is coming just from that single pixel. So the input is mono audio. It, com it contains the combination of all the sounds. But by training jointly vision and audio, we can actually separate which particulars of the audio signal come from which parts of the visual signal. But what is interesting is that we do this in an unsupervised way. The supervision, there is no supervision. There is no ground truth. We just feed to the system with lots of videos where there are mixtures of sounds. Sometimes you hear mixtures, sometimes you don't hear mixtures, and the system has to figure out which objects exist on the world, what visual categories are there, what audio categories are there, and how they go together, and how do you tell, how do you extract one signal from, from this mixture? So given a video with an input audio, you, you do this, you, know, you, you have this system that will do the audiovisual sound source separation and localization, but what is interesting is that this system will be learned in an unsupervised way. And then you can click on different pixels, and you should hear what is the sound wave coming from any pixel that you click. So that you know all the sound waves, if you sum them up, it should be more or less equal to the input. And then the different components should really sound like the object that you have there. So here is an example of how it works. So you click in this pixel. So this is what you hear. And if you click here. And if you click here, then you don't hear anything because it knows that that pixel is not making any sounds. So we train this system. And one thing that so we thought we were really clever when we were doing this. And then we realized that there was a lot of really concurrent work that was really interesting. And Tali is going to be talking about one that is really amazing with different speakers. And so all these papers kind of appear together at the same time. So we, we realized that we were about to publish all these papers together. So we kind of synchronized to the, re the release on archive. But uh, what is really interesting is that all of them tackle this problem of combining vision and audio to solve this problem. They all try to solve 
particular aspects of this problem. So they are not, we are not all trying to solve the exact same problem. It's just different pieces of this big problem. And what is interesting is that if you put them all together, you can see where all this is going. And I think that there is a lot of exciting work that will happen in the near future. So that's all um, I wanted to say here. So I think that we have time for some questions. There are microphones in the aisles for anybody who has questions. Thanks, that was excellent. Um, so one thing that I'm curious about, so your, everything is with 2D images and monaural audio recordings. Do you see any benefits of going to 3D? So training with 3D models and maybe learning, instead of pixels on an image, learning a location in space or learning a room impulse response or some, some wider dimensional description of what's going on both visually and auditorily. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that would be great. Yes, I think that would be very interesting. And I, in fact, there, is, there are several efforts going in that direction, like Josh McDermott is doing a lot of work in like, doing audiovisual simulation with 3D so that you, know, you can get that type of signals. Sometimes for us, one of the problems in, in our case is that all my students are computer vision people. So as soon as you, put them, um, you hand them a microphone, they don't know what to do with it. And um, it just makes some of these things really, really hard. So this is why these collaborations uh, across different fields are so interesting. But I, I totally agree that will be great. And I think that there will be a lot more things that we could do. But we just haven't get, gotten there yet. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned in your talk, oh, you know, this uh, could be used as a, a car detector, but it's not a very good one. I'm wondering, are there tasks um, where, uh, like, this is um, currently sort of the best way to solve a problem, or what tasks do you see as be having the most potential for this helping? Yes, so for instance, in computer vision, there is a lot of interest now in, in reducing the amount of label data that you need in order to train a system. So many people are interested in seeing if you have, you can build unsupervised tasks that will give you generic descriptors that then you can use to learn with little supervision to solve a particular task. So that type of unsupervised learning uh, can be done in many different ways. This is one example of how we can do that unsupervised learning. And for these transfer learning techniques, where you can then you know, initialize your network with this particular task, and then you fine tune it to something else. When that paper was published, this was the state of the art there. But you know, the state of the art in computer vision changes every week. So it became, you know, by the time we published the paper, it wasn't the state of the art anymore. But that's an example of a task where this type of training has a lot of benefits also in computer vision. So thanks for the talk. Um, you were showing pictures of the images that most act, that uh, were the highest um, activating inputs for certain units. And then you also identified sort of the faces in those images with the black mask. Was that just to help us out, or how did you get the mask? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I went very fast over that. So each unit on the image is really a filter that passes through the entire picture. So it's not a single region on the image. It's really like a convolution. So the, the responses are going to be strong in different pieces of the image. So the way that we select those units is, first, we run all the images through the network. And for each image, we look, for each unit, we look at the image that produces the maximum response across space somewhere in the picture for that particular unit. So we rank them or we rank order them that way. And then for each image, we, s we show the region of the image that actually produced the strong responses. So it's just a threshold on the activity of the, of the unit. So we are not, so this masking is really showing what region of the image is the one producing the strong activation. So, so the interesting thing is that when you, when you see these things, no, it, really, it really latches on the objects that you, you are interested in detecting. Okay. All right, let's thank Antonio one more time.